Good morning, everyone. Happy sunny Thursday. Thank you for joining us all this morning. Uh, welcome to the Center for Technical Development's webinar series and today's presentation on agricultural land use mapping in Washington State, uh, presented by our special guest speaker, Joel DeMori. My name is Jan Thomas and I am the uh, CTD member and I'll be moderating uh, today's webinar for us. The CTD hosts these webinar series on the third Thursday of each month on a wide variety of topics. Um, you can find all of our upcoming webinars on the CTD website. We have a few special sessions in the next month or so, so be sure to check out the website for uh, more information on those. And if you have an idea for a webinar, we would love to hear from you. Uh, many of these webinars are born from an idea or a suggestion from our audience. So if you have something you'd like to see, please send an, us an email. You can send that to training at wactd.org. I'm just going to run through a couple of quick logistics. We are in a webinar mode, and so you are all muted um, as attendees. We do welcome your questions, however, so you can type those at any time into the questions box, and I can um, read them out for Joel uh, to answer for us. We'll try to take a couple of pauses throughout the presentation to answer questions, but we'll uh, hold most of them probably for the end for a Q&A there. Um, you can also raise your hand, so that little hand icon, um, if you just prefer to ask your question directly, a lot of times that's easier. You can just raise your hand and I will unmute you from my side. You will probably also need to unmute yourself before we'll be able to hear you. Um, if you have any questions or issues with your audio or visual this morning, you can put those into the questions box and I will try to help you uh, troubleshoot as best I can. And if I could just get one or two folks to type something into the question box just to make sure that Joel and I are talking to our audience here and not just to ourselves, um, that would be great. Anything in there? Is it sunny where you are this morning? It's very sunny here. So that's, that's, there we go. Good morning. Okay, good. So that questions box is working. Um, so feel free to put those questions in at any point and we will address them. I think that's everything. So I will turn it over now to our speaker, Joel, who's going to introduce himself and get us started. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. I will start by making sure that everyone can see my screen and see the correct screen. Yeah, that looks good, Joel. That looks good. All right, great. Well, thank you for the brief introduction and I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to share this program with everybody who's on board today and and thank you Jan and uh, the Conservation Commission for um, allowing me to present this information to everyone today. Again, my name is Joel Damery. I'm environmental specialist with the State Department of Agriculture. I'm in the Natural Resources Assessment section. We're in the director's office of our agency. And um, again, I'm going to talk to you today about our agricultural land use mapping program. And I'll cover um, a wide variety of topics today. Some of them relate to the other programs we have, um, but it all ties back into our mapping. And hopefully, this can give you some ideas of how you can use our mapping data for some projects on your end, or how um, really just to um, help you out with any projects. And um, we'll go from there. So here's a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'm going to cover. I'm going to start by covering who is the Natural Resources Assessment Section, why do we exist, why did we start, and I'll cover. I'll next go into what is the purpose of surveying agriculture, why do we do it. There's a lot of different reasons, and um, I'll follow that by talking about what data do we collect, and then how can you access the data as the public, and what. What is the data used for? So what are some projects that we use the data for and how can other groups, other agencies, other entities use our data uh, uh, to really to benefit their groups? And lastly, I'll talk about the future of agricultural land use mapping in Washington state. So I'm a part of the natural resources assessment section, like I had mentioned earlier. And to give you a brief, brief background on myself, um, I grew up in Eastern Washington and I graduated from WSU with a degree in natural resource sciences. 
And then I started to work for the state in 2014, and I've been here ever since. I work out of, I currently work out of our Olympia, Washington office. And again, our group is in the director's office of our agency. So that essentially means that the agency director is our manager and is our boss. And we're a small research group and we're non-regulatory. Um, we have a wide variety of expertise on our staff that so ranges from hydrogeologists to environmental engineers and uh, aquatic toxicologists and experts in aquatic biology and also folks like myself who I specialize in G some GIS work and ag land use mapping and, and pesticides. We have 13 staff that would be eight out of uh, the Olympia office and five out of our Yakima office. And we have a variety of programs and I'll briefly talk about a few of them today and really how they can relate to our agricultural land use mapping program. Um, but I'll mention a few extra ones here on this slide. So our we have a soil health program that's led by a few different people on our staff and we really, really are taking the initiative to learn more about soil health and to in Washington State. And the next program is our surface water monitoring program for pesticides. And I'll, I have a few more slides of this presentation that I will cover that program and how it relates to ag land use mapping and overall general um, knowledge and, and the data that we gain about pesticides and how they might affect all of our natural resources in the state. The next program is our pesticide usage program. And I, I lead that program in our group. And that I can have a few slides about that one as well. But that's where we try and gather information, collect data on what pesticides might be applied and the quantity on certain crops in the state. We also have groundwater and drought programs. And then also somewhat relates to some other minor programs we have like water quantity programs as well. And the big one that I'll be talking about today, obviously, is our agricultural land use mapping work. Um, if you want more information on our group, you can simply Google WSDA NRAS, and that'll just that'll bring you right to our webpage. Throughout this presentation, you can see this photo here of some crops. Throughout this presentation, I have a variety of photos that I've shared, and this is taken from some of the field work that we do from a lot of the windshield surveys that we conduct in order to collect this data. So I thought it would be interesting if whoever's on board here, if you would like to possibly scribble down some notes or make some mental notes of maybe what you think these crops are. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll go back through. Some of them will be really tricky. And I kind of did that on purpose to, just to show a just a variety of agriculture that we have in Washington. But if you feel like taking a note, mental note, again, at the end of the presentation, I'll go back through and then we can ID some of these crops. So the goal of the natural resources assessment section really is to focus on the impacts of agricultural chemicals on our state's nat natural resources. That's really a broad goal. That's really what our programs focus on. The mapping program that I'll be talking about today really gives us in the broad sense where are pesticides being applied in Washington state. There's obviously pesticide applications that occur outside of agricultural areas. But really, that's the scope of our agency. That's who we support. That's the industry we support. So that really gives us the where are these pesticides being applied across the state. And some of our other programs, like the pesticide usage program, really lets us know, well, how much or how many pesticides are being applied on those acres that we have mapped. And then lastly, what sort of ties it all together is, well, we, we know where these pesticides are being applied. And we know on certain commodities, well, how much or how many pesticides are being applied. So then lastly, how much of it is making it into the surface water? And that's one of our other programs that I'll briefly be talking about first. So why does NRAS exist? Why, how did we begin? Well, if you see on this map here on the right, the green is just the background to Washington State, but the gray areas are endangered or threatened salmon. It's called evolutionary significant units. You can think of it as just important areas for endangered or threatened salmon species. And how our program started was early in the 2000s uh, when, those sam when those separate salmon species were listed under the Endangered Species Act, 
it was our goal and why NRAS was formed to better understand how pesticide applications and agricultural practices might be affecting some of those species. So on the map here on the right side, this is the same map as previous, but now we have our ag land use mapping data thrown on it as well. In the blue areas are the areas that there's agriculture, but it's outside of those endangered salmon habitats, whereas the pink area is where we see agriculture within those endangered salmon habitats, and that's where there's the co-occurrence between pesticide use that may be affecting salmon, and that's the areas that we focus a lot of our work on, although we map crops statewide. That's where we focus a lot of our other work is in those, is in those areas. So again, it was in the early 2000s. Um, we wanted to really understand and answer the call for more information about how pesticides could be affecting salmon. And our, our group has expanded since then. We focus our efforts still on endangered species, certainly, but it's, it's expanded just beyond salmon. And we, our goal really is to be able to allow industry and, and growers to keep the tools, keep the pesticide tools that are available for them and keep aquatic ecosystems healthy at the same time. So I'll briefly again talk about the surface water surface water monitoring program of ours. So this is um, a program where we sample from a, a variety of sites statewide during the typical pesticide use season. So that's usually from March until September. So we sample weekly, and here's a staff member in one of the streams that we sample in the Yakima area. And this is called an ambient program. So we're just looking, we're not targeting specific applications. We're really just gathering information, background information about what sort of pesticides are making it into the water bodies. And the, the last previous, the few previous years, we've looked for um, over 175 different pesticide active ingredients in the water. So that includes um, herbicides and fungicides and insecticides, as well as insect repellents and pesticide degradants, um, really a, a wood preservatives, antimicrobials. It's a wide variety of different pesticide products and active ingredients. And what we do is we assess each detection to see if it's coming close to a level that might be harmful to aquatic life, not just fish, but also aquatic invertebrates or aquatic plants. So, and we do rely on our ag land use mapping data to help support this program. Here's a map that shows the different sites that we monitored in 2020 statewide. So the yellow dots here, some of them are in Eastern Washington, some of them are in Western Washington. And in Western Washington, we had two sites that were considered urban to really try and understand, capture urban pesticide runoff. And the other ones in Skagit and Whatcom County covered um, were in agricultural areas. And then in Eastern Washington, we had sites we have sites near Wenatchee, uh, really in some high density tree, tree fruit growing areas. Also in Crab Creek, which drains um, a substantial area in the Columbia Basin, as well as the Yakima Valley, which has a very wide variety of agriculture and then into the dryland agriculture areas in the Palouse as well. So this other program, our pesticide usage program, again, I'll just very briefly talk about this and later I'll describe how this ties into the agricultural land use mapping. This is a program that I lead where we host meetings with commodity groups to collect pesticide usage data. It's not mandatory for growers and applicators in Washington to let the state lead pesticide agency know what pesticides they're applying and when. So the best way we have understanding is to simply go and ask. And that's really to analyze and to better understand real world pesticide applications. Uh, lots of times, and I'll talk about this later on, but during pesticide registration processes, um, maximum label assumptions are made. So EPA or other federal entities might um, assume that a certain pesticide product is being used on all available crops on the label and at the maximum number of times per year and at the maximum label rates. And so that's something, if we collect real world data, that we, we share that, that data with the federal partners in order for them to make the most informed 
decisions when it comes to pesticide registrations. So we, we kind of covered those two background items. And next, I'll hop into the ag land use component to my presentation. So I'll start off by really what is the purpose of surveying agriculture in Washington? And this is a nice map put together by our communications office and our agency. And it really shows just briefly, really, the wide variety of agriculture that we grow in Washington. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with the really dominant crops, such as apples and wheat, um, maybe potatoes and sweet cherries. We also we grow a lot of different crops, um, really a very wide variety, and this is a nice map, a nice visual that shows um, just the types of different agriculture that we grow in Washington. The purpose, and there's a, there's a many different reasons why we serve the agriculture, but one of the primary ones is simply to understand where crops are grown. So you can think of our agricultural land use mapping program as a census of agriculture. Um, it really helps us define the growing areas for certain crops and understand crop rotations. Um, it's really important for our agency. We, uh, we it's our job to support Washington agriculture. So really understanding where the crops are grown um, is really important for us to help support our stakeholders and also to understand natural resources issues that might arise as well. So understanding and, and Mapping crops also gives us the geographic location of pesticide and fertilizer use in Washington. Like I mentioned earlier, although there's definitely other pesticide applications that occur on roadways and um, around schools, and certainly homeowners apply pesticides, agriculture is obviously um, a very heavy user. And so it's important for us to understand the location of pesticide and fertilizer use statewide. It, it helps our agency make decisions based off of science and data. And I'll show some maps in a, a little bit, but it's, a, it's important when we're making, again, uh, decisions that we know really the amount of acres of certain crops and really where they're grown. And, yeah, it helps minimize assumptions. It also helps our agency and our group analyze crop patterns and acreages um, over space and over time so we can understand the, the acres of certain crops if they're increasing or decreasing say in the last 10 to 15 years and we can better understand where are these crops being grown where where are we seeing the increase and decrease and have very accurate data to support that versus just assumptions that yes this area is growing some more apples or yes this area there's more potatoes being grown here it really helps us give us very firm data. Also, it's used by our agency in the risk assessment process. So that's um, another word for product registrations. So when a product is registered for use by EPA at the federal level, our state also registers that product in Washington. And it's important if a product, for example, um, one of the label crops is potatoes. Well, we want to know where are the potatoes being grown? How many acres could this potentially be used on? And it also helps us better understand endangered species issues in Washington. If a certain product um, is asking to be used on, again, a certain crop, well, do we know where the endangered species are near that crop? And if so, do we think there's going to be any conflicts or any issues that might arise from some of these product registrations? So I, I just covered some of the natural resources issues like endangered species. It also helps us understand water quality concerns as well. And I'll get into an example a little, um, a little bit later, but it helps us narrow down some of our monitoring sites that we want to look for. We, uh, we want to sample um, certain water bodies that can be weightable that we can take samples from. And we also want to sample water bodies that contain with the watersheds contain a large amount of agriculture. So it really helps us narrow down some of our monitoring sites. Also, internally, our mapping data can be used for some natural resources emergencies, such as drought. In 2015, 
when we had a pretty significant drought in Washington, we, we were able to go out and map some of the damage to certain crops. And from that mapping, we're able to have a very accurate um, really depiction of the drought damage that was caused and how um, it affected agriculture in Washington. Not only that, but after wildfires as well, we're able to go and map agriculture and see how much was affected, where was it affected, and do we need to supply any more resources to certain areas to help out growers and farmers. Externally, our data is used by a, really a wide variety of organizations and entities. One of the primary ones is we have a partnership with USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service and the Cropland Data Layer. Um, if any of you are GIS users or if you're familiar with agriculture, the Cropland Data Layer or the CDL is a nationwide raster or GIS layer that depicts land use and specifically agriculture nationwide. And what we do is we're able to share some of our mapping data annually to USDA NAS to help them train their satellites for certain crops so that their remote sensing is even more accurate for Washington State and for other states. And in return, for some of the areas that we're not able to map via windshield surveys or there's too many acres, for example, in eastern Washington in the Blues, where we have a million acres of agriculture just in Whitman County, there's no way via driving around and windshield surveys that we would be able to map those areas. But because the fields are so large and because, because of the large fields, field sizes, we're able to use that cropland data layer, that remotely sensed data to update our own database as well. So we give USDA NAS some of the annual data and we receive some of those areas of the state that have large fields that, that can be accurately classified from that cropland data layer. Externally, our data can also be used in national risk assessments. So we do share all of our mapping data with EPA and the National Marine Fishery Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA for national risk assessments for endangered species for pesticide registrations. So if EPA has some concerns, about an endangered species in Washington, and they really want really high level, uh, high, ac high accuracy mapping data, um, they can certainly use our data to help with that process. And I have, I have a picture here. Um, I, I can just let you know what this picture is. This is a picture of some drought damage in 2015. This was a orchard of Fuji apples. So again, this is one of the internal purposes of why we collect data. We're able to help out with some emergency operations and maps and map some drought damage. So externally, other agencies already use our data. So that and that includes some conservation districts and universities as well. WSU certainly uses our data and we've had a wide variety of researchers ask for our data to use it in a multitude of studies. Also, I'm, I'm familiar with different counties also using our data for the Voluntary Stewardship Program. We have some other experts in our group besides myself that work in the Voluntary Stewardship Program that would have more information about how exactly the different counties are using our data for that for that program. So here's a map that really shows the beginning of agricultural land use mapping in Washington State. So you, this is a map that really just shows the general areas, and this is really the best that we could do prior to starting this program. So we could generally say that maybe there's berries growing in northwestern Washington. We know that, blueberries and raspberries. And we know that Okanagan area and also the Yakima area has a lot of orchards. And also the Yakima area has mixed vegetables as well. But really this is some of the best that we could do. We, it was more general knowledge about crop growing areas around the state. 
And so what it has transformed to since this program began is a very robust and accurate data set. And this is a snapshot of our web map that we have available online. And I will follow this link and try and open this for, and we'll just take a quick journey through our web map and what it's, cap what it's capable of showing the users online. And this is just available on our website. So at this scale that you can see right now, the data is summarized by section, so by square mile, and it shows the dominant crop in each section. And as you zoom in on the map, it will change to field level data. So it'll change the background and it'll show imagery and it'll show all of the different fields, every field of agriculture in the state. We map every field that's bigger than one half acre statewide. So you can see it's a very robust data set and some of the data attributes that are shown I'll click on a polygon right here. This online web map shows, it displays the crop group instead of the crop type. If you download the GIS data, it will show the full suite of the data that we collect. So the crop group just means it's a, the category of the crop. So in other words, this just says it's a vegetable crop. It also displays the acres and the irrigation type. This one's obviously pretty circular. So this is a center pivot irrigated field. It also displays the initial survey date. So this we first surveyed this field in 2003, and we last updated this field uh, last year in 2020 in July. It shows the data source. We do have different entities and different groups who collect data for us, and we also we divide all of our field, all of our fields by the township range and section so to help categorize and organize our mapping data. It also shows the county, which is Grant County. And if we have and if there's any cover cropping information as well. So this web map is very useful just for general knowledge. And if you're curious about what might be grown in your area, this can certainly help. It's a very useful tool. Next, I'll follow up by talking about, so how do we survey agriculture? Really, first and foremost, we follow our standard operating procedures and our quality insurance project plans. That's really to maintain uh, the same methods between different people statewide. We want, to, we want it to be as accurate data as possible. And that also means maintaining the same scale when we update fields. That's a one to 5,000 scale of, of accuracy when we're delineating field borders. And we also have to maintain better than 90% crop classification in each of the counties that we survey. We usually, um, re we always reach that and lately we've been, uh, our accuracy has been between 95% and 100% accuracy in each county that we've mapped recently. So a lot of the annual crops, again, not those, none of those crops that we can survey from that remotely sensed um, cropland data layer, we map via windshield surveys. So you'll see in some of these pictures that I've been showing that a lot of, it, a lot of them look like they're, they've been taken from the side of a road or from the shoulder, and that's absolutely correct. That's how we map a lot of the crops in the state. And I cover, I've, I cover Western Washington, and we have two staff that cover Eastern Washington. And we do have to time our windshield surveys really to the areas and the counties that we're mapping to be able to really hit certain areas at certain times of the year. For example, a lot of, a lot of vegetable crops and a lot of annual crops need to be mapped between June, really June and September, Whereas other crops such as Christmas trees or maybe some pastures or really in Eastern Washington, some orchards 
can be mapped at off times of year. So it, it really is it's very important to capture certain areas um, really in certain times of the year and be able to prioritize that type of work. We do, we do map each county in Washington. We update it every two to three years. Um, we're not able to map every acre every year with the staffing that we have. And also we sometimes contract out our mapping to other groups. If we're not able to fully cover the counties that we want in a certain year, we have contracted out with multiple conservation districts to assist with our mapping. That includes Island County and Whatcom County, also Benton County as well, and Clark County. Those are just some off the top of my head. So we have contra contracted out the work and they've been able to assist with data collection. We, our windshield surveys, we do cover, try to target areas that aren't covered by FSA, that we're not able to get the data in a, in a different way. And I'll, I'll show a few other pictures here. Um, this is a, obviously another picture taken from a roadside of a different crop. And we, we record all of our data on site meaning we, we have tablets that we bring out and I'll get into some of the technology in a little bit. And we also have paper maps. So all of our data is recorded on the side of the road, on the shoulder, mo most all of it. And um, really it's very high quality and accurate mapping data. So here's a snapshot of that same web map I was showing you online. This one is from the Skag from Skagit County in Western Washington. And I just wanted to show really the diversity of agriculture and different crops that we do grow in, in, in some parts of the state. In Western Washington, certainly Skagit County has the highest diversity and highest density of different crops. I wanted to show this to better understand how in some parts of the state, in some counties, we might only be able to map maybe a few sections worth of agriculture in a day, whereas other counties, we might be able to map the entire county in a single day. So it really depends on the density of agriculture and a, and a wide variety of factors as well. In Western Washington, some of the difficulty uh, has to do with trees and traffic, as I like to say. Certainly, the amount of vegetation that that's growing and on the sides of the road can make it difficult to view and ID some crops. And also, depending on the county, such as King County or Snohomish County, certainly traffic and the population can also make it uh, increasingly difficult to survey as well. This is another snapshot, and this is from Eastern Washington. This is the Mar Marion Drain just south of Yakima. And I also wanted to show this um, as well to really visually see the diversity and the amount of agriculture that we do map. This is just in one small section of one county. And really a, a very wide variety is grown here, vegetables and tree fruit and a lot of other crops. So how else do we survey agriculture? Well, we, we conduct a lot of windshield surveys, but also we collect data from producers as well. If we are not able to gain access to certain areas, not every field in the state can we see from a public road. And we are, we're required to stay on public roads unless we have authority or unless we've asked the landowner to be able to go onto the private property. So it does limit us to what we can see. Um, and certainly a lot of more areas in Eastern Washington, producers have to be contacted in order to map those specific areas. We also use outside sources, like I mentioned before, like the cropland data layer, a lot of the really huge dryland fields and a lot of the center pivot 
fields in eastern Washington are able to be mapped from that cropland data layer. The, the pixel size, the resolution of the cropland data layer is 30 meters. So for a lot of the crops in western Washington and a lot of really small fields, it's not able to accurately classify those crops. So we really can only use the cropland data for cropland data layer for large, for really large fields. In addition, we do use aerial and satellite imagery as well. That it really helps us with field borders and some crop classification. We use the NAEP imagery, which is flown by airplane um, on every odd year in Washington State. So it was flown in 2019. It will be flown this year, 2021. And I'll show you an example in just a second of, of really how it can assist with some of the field borders for our data and also classifying agriculture as well. And recently, really, I would say in the last five years, using satellite imagery has been increasingly helpful to map field borders. We do use the Landsat 8 satellite, it's American satellite. There's also a European satellite, Sentinel 2, which provides really it's I like to think of it as live image feeds of anywhere in the world every two weeks on average so during the growing season certainly when there's minimal cloud cover it can be very helpful it's certainly its resolution is not nearly what the nape imagery is but it still can be very helpful during some times of the year when there, when there's not cloud cover to really help with field borders and IDing crops from the road. I wanted to show you this image right here. So this is what I mean by using the NAEP imagery to help define field borders. On the image on the right where you can see this crop, you can see this row of trees and this house in the background. And this is the crop that trying to ID and delineate the field borders and on the right is what you see from the nape excuse me on the left is what you see from the nape imagery you can see the same row of trees and you can see the house as well and especially with this specific crop just the way it's planted and grown it's very easy to use this imagery to help define that field border it's this area is very flat and it's it can be difficult to really see the end of this field, how far back does it go? Especially if it's being blocked by trees or houses. So this is an example, and this star represents where I took this photo from. And so this is an example of how you can use this NAEP imagery to help define field borders and really to also help classify crops in some circumstances. So how do we survey agriculture? Well, we I have a picture here of the old method that we used to survey view windshield surveys. So we used to use a laptop connected to a dashboard GPS and paper maps. We still use paper maps to collect data, but we've since moved on to tablets. And these tablets, uh, really they're, they're iPads, and they have the Esri collector app on it. And it's really helped immensely with how fluid and how seamless and smooth our crop updating has become compared to some of the older methods. I'll, I'll show some screenshots in just a second. Um, in addition to our tablet, really uh, what we need is a mapping vehicle, uh, obviously a good set of binoculars or a spotting scope, and we still use paper maps as well. Uh, we need safety lights on our vehicles and, and certainly vehicle magnets to let landowners and everyone else know who we are, what we're doing, um, especially in, in a lot of different parts uh, of the state. It's important to let landowners know who you are and, and, and what you are doing there. The Collector app has offline capability, uh, which is very important because um, it's more frequently do you go to areas to map agriculture and you do not have good cell service to update crops in the area. So it has offline capabilities of a cloud-based service. So the, our database is hosted in the cloud and we're able to download areas for offline use 
that update the crops if we want from the tablet. And then when we get back in a cell service, we have a Wi-Fi signal, we're able to update the crops. I did want to mention that we still use paper maps very frequently. One reason is in certain areas, um, really there might not be a good shoulder to stop off at when IDing crops, or especially in Western Washington, there can be a lot of traffic. So oftentimes you don't want to spend a lot of time on the side of the road IDing a crop, and then certainly it, it takes a little bit more time to update via the app than it would from a paper map. And so we want to minimize, we want to maximize safety and really sometimes minimize the amount of time on a roadside. And then we can go back into the office and use our paper maps to update from some Esri de desktop software. Here are a few screenshots from the ArcGIS Collector app. So on the left side here, and this is from Island County, on the left side is what it looks like from a phone. And so you can click on the different fields, and on the right side are the details of the crop that appear. This is for this is a screenshot from 2017. In 2017, this specific field was fescue seed, and it also displays the irrigation. Again, some of the same attributes that I was showing earlier, and you can edit from the app. And again, it'll, if you have cell service, it'll sync up live and update that hosted GIS feature service. If you don't have cell service, it will keep it locally, and then you're able to sync back up when back into cell service or have a Wi-Fi signal. So it's it's very smooth and it's greatly helped with our field work and how we organize our mapping data. When we do collect data on paper maps, a lot of work is done from the desktop. So this involves either using ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap. I now prefer to use ArcGIS Pro. Um, it's a lot more smooth. It's a lot faster than using ArcMap. Both are Esri products. And again, this is just a screenshot of what some of the polygons would look like. They're transparent, obviously. You can just see the red border. But from this screen, you can make and um, make changes to the data and edit them, edit the field borders as needed for certain crops and, and make the updates from the desktop. So a lot of what we do for windshield surveys is a lot of driving, but there's also quite a bit of desktop work as well. So I wanted to hop into what data do we collect? Now you kind of understand how we collect the data and via what software and what methods, but what data do we collect? Well, really, uh, we collect data for every agricultural field in the state larger than one half acre. So as of, uh, as of 2020, that's a little over 225,000 fields um, and 8 million acres of agriculture. Uh, and every polygon besides just a few are all hand drawn as well. And we, like I mentioned earlier, we update every county every two to three years. There's some rare circumstances where we're not able to update a certain county every three years, but um, vast, vast majority of the time, everything's updated every two to three years. And like I had mentioned, some of the additional attributes include uh, irrigation type of the fields, the initial and the last survey date, the county, the crop rotation as well. So what was the crop type the previous time we mapped it? You know, what are potential crop rotations? And also the data sources. Did we map it? Did, did WSDA map it? Are we updating fields using NAS? Did a conservation district update it? So that data is included as well. And we also include cover cropping in the data set. So what does agriculture include? So you might think of agriculture as apples, potatoes, cherries, and corn, but we include a, quite a few of other categories that you might not think as, of agriculture, and they really aren't agriculture in some ways. So what this would include, and I have a list here of just some of them, we do include shellfish beds in our data. So this is an example of data that we do not collect. 
So the Department of Health is really the, the lead agency for shellfish beds and pesticides are applied on shellfish beds. So we do have that included in our data set about all the approved shellfish beds locations in Washington state. We also include golf courses and driving ranges. That might be a bit of a surprise, but compared to other land use types, uh, there are certainly higher users of, of pesticides and you know herbicides. So we do include golf courses and driving ranges in our data set. Um, we also map flower bulbs and pastures as well. We do survey fallow fields. So that includes fallow fields that have been tilled and are remaining tilled for that growing season and also fields that are left to go idle. So a few different types of fallow. We also map conservation areas and um, CRP areas. So CRP, really that's um, it's frequently rotated in, if you will, with wheat and wheat fallow systems in Eastern Washington. And so we do survey and survey for CRP lands. We also um, map conservation areas. So what we mean by that is if we have a field near a stream, um, we can just say in Western Washington and the landowner has decided to increase the riparian buffer around that stream and he's taken some of his land out of production and now it's permanently, there's tree plantings um, and now it's permanently out of production for agriculture. We do try to map those, those stream buffers. Um, we also map nurseries. So that includes silvicultural nurseries. So warehouser nurseries where they grow small trees to be planted for forestry uh, for forestry areas. That involves lavender nurseries, ornamental nurseries, greenhouses. So uh, really uh, orchard nurseries, a wide variety of different nursery types. We also survey wildlife feed. So these are areas typically managed by WDFW that it's agriculture that's really grown for wildlife feed. Uh, there's quite a bit of, quite a bit, at least in Western Washington, in Skagit County, there's certainly quite a bit in Clark County as well. Uh, we also map Christmas trees and also marijuana and hemp, which are two separate crops. Uh, marijuana, at least, is one of the easier crops to ID because it has 10 foot tall black fencing and security cameras, which is very unique. But um, hemp is really a newer crop as well. And I think you'd seen on one of the previous screens that at least the, the, the hemp fields that I've seen, they typically have signs that let you know that they are growing hemp and not marijuana, just so the public is aware of what specific crop they are growing. We also map WSU research stations. So WSU has a number of research stations all across the state in a lot of different counties where they conduct trials. And we map those areas as well. We map poplar plantations and also sod farms. And like I had mentioned, mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, silvicultural nur nurseries as well. So really a wide variety including all of the normal agriculture that you would think of in Washington. And also one of the most important is developed lands. So what I mean by that is lands that were previously mapped by us as agriculture, as a specific crop, and are now permanently taken out and they've been permanently developed. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Here is a, and I just took this from Google Earth, so this is a screenshot of, and it is blurry because this data, this imagery was, I believe this is from the 90s. And this is the Puyallup River Valley, and this is the Renton River Valley. And if any of you are familiar with this area, you've known that, that things have changed drastically over the last 20 years. And it's really important to map and document what is no longer what is no longer in agriculture. And here's an example of what it looks like now from 2020. So obviously there's a lot of white roofs, a lot of warehouses that have gone in. Most of the agriculture in this area is, is really is no longer. 
And so it's really critical for us to map these developed areas as well. So what are some what are some of the uh, what does agriculture not include in our database? So what is not included is recreational fields such as sports complexes and schools and churches. There's although they might use more herbicides than maybe some other land use types, there's there's no way with our manpower, there's no way that we can survey all these areas and we, we really we do not want to include these areas as agriculture in Washington. We also do not include rangeland. So it's, it does differ from pasture, certainly. And in Western Washington, we don't have what you would generally think of as rangeland, but certainly in Eastern Washington, we do. And we do not currently survey um, for rangeland and also not for forestry as well. That is um, DNR's scope of work. So I've covered you know, who we are and what is the purpose of surveying agriculture and then what data do we collect. And now I'll go into well, how can you access the data. And then I'll show examples of how we use the data and it might spark some interest and give you ideas of how you could possibly use this data or uh, for certain programs that you have and how it can maybe make the work that you do more efficient. And so I'll give you some examples in so, just a few slides. Oh, yep. We did have a couple of questions here related to the, the mapping part, if we want to just um, address those before we move on. Um, one question was, it would be interesting to hear more about the VSP topic and how folks utilize your maps, especially any in the shrub step and change direction, change detection around weeds. I um, I can give, um, we have a few other staff members in our group who work with VSP counties. And I think it would be, I could give you the names of how exactly those counties use it. I'm, I'm not the expert, but I know it's currently being used. So um, you can send me an email and I'll share as much information as I can about that. Great, thank you. Um, and then we had a, a question about the FSA um, data um, said, mentioned the map areas where they don't get data from FSA. How is Washington able to get the crop data from FSA? In Oregon, we've been told that they do not share their crop data. Well, I think, and I will say I'm not the expert in this because in Western Washington, we don't run into very many of those situations, but I, I think it's a combination of just contacting landowners and maybe personal relationships with certain growers. I think um, if you want to know more specifically, I'll give you the information to, um, to contact Perry Beal. He's the program manager for this program and he has been doing this. He started the program 20 years ago, so he can give you a lot more information about how we, we do use FSA data to help. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of information on that because in Western Washington, it's it's simply not really not needed for a lot of our areas. Okay, great, thank you. And then just a couple of questions here about um, where you map and where you don't. Why are golf courses mapped as agricultural use? And I and think also, I, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. And also, um, how can you tell the difference between a silviculture operation and a forested property? And that's a very good question. Um, well, we do map golf courses simply because they're, they're higher herbicide and pesticide users than other land use types. Um, you know, in order to maintain the greens, et cetera, they have to use quite a bit of product. So that's something that we felt obligated to include. And I do wanna say that in Western Washington, um, golf courses is, a top, is one of the top five um, agricultural land uses in western washington so there's a lot of acres of golf courses and driving ranges but again it's simply just to um, to capture you know a heavier pesticide user compared to other land use types and i that's a very good question about silviculture um and that's that's an area that can be tricky to map 
So we do map Christmas trees. And so when we come across a field of Christmas trees that ended up not being harvested for Christmas trees, you know, we categorize that as silviculture. And lots of times the landowners will let the trees uh, grow and then harvest them at a larger size. And we don't map tree farms, um, but and typically silvicultural operations are very small. So what it really is, is Christmas trees that haven't been harvested that grow up to be larger, but uh, really it's about the size of the operation. We don't map forestry lands. So silviculture operations are usually very small. Um, so I hope that gives you some more detail. Great, thank you. I just have one more question about the mapping, then we'll let you get on with how we can access this. Um, will you be mapping conversion of agricultural land to renewable energy like solar panels? I think if we came across a situation like that, we would call it the developed land. And in our data base, which we don't show on the public end, is we have notes that we take for each field. So it's certainly something that we I would keep in the notes that it's being developed for solar panel use, but that isn't something that's a current uh, current crop type, so to speak, is those types of land uses, but it's something certainly to think about um, for the future. Okay, great, thank you. All right, well, next, thank you for those questions. Those were good, those are very good questions. Uh, next, I'll hop into how, how can you access the data? And I guess briefly, you can access the data by going on our website. I'll click on the link here. It's just agr.wa.gov slash ag science. So this is our NRAS webpage. And you can scroll down to this agricultural land use link. I'm, I'm hoping this is um, updating appropriately on everyone else's end. But if you click on that agricultural land use link and scroll down, here is the link you can just click on this map to access that web map that i was showing earlier and we also have a pivot table so that's just an excel pivot table to help um, more quickly just analyze numbers of crops and irrigations and irrigation types and if download the gis data you can simply click on this link right here and it's available as a file an esri file geodatabase and so you do have to have the appropriate software to be able to open that up and look at the data. If you don't, and um, if you don't have access to uh, Esri products, or if, you're, if you think you might have trouble opening up the file to your database, just email us, and we'll be able to, we'll probably be able to make that data available um, as a shapefile or as a different, um, in a different or in a different format. You know, other ways you can access this. If you forget our egg science URL, you can just Google WSDA NRAS or you can Google WSDA crop mapping. You can certainly email myself or call me and the two other employees that, that really manage the Eastern Washington side um, I have their information here. So Perry Beal, he manages the program. He started mapping from um, the early 2000s. And he would have more information about FSA. That's who I, That's who you'd need to contact. Um, he has more information about Eastern Washington mapping, definitely. And he started the program, so he's he's seen really every agricultural field essentially with his own eyes in the whole state of Washington. And Emily Oberhofer, she also covers Eastern Washington as well, and she um, you can also contact her if you have any questions. Like I had mentioned earlier, um, the data is available as a file geodatabase. And it's 
that it will require Esri ArcGIS software to open it, but you can certainly email us and talk about different data formats as well. So that's how you can access the data. It's online, um, very easy to download it. We have we update the data every year. So and it's available. So the 2020 data set just became available a few weeks ago on our web page. We work throughout the winter time to update our paper maps and to make sure the field borders are as accurate as possible. And then we make the data set available in the springtime. Again, we're not able to update every county every year. So not every county was updated in 2020, but we have that data. We have the most recent that we have available online. So what is the data used for? And I'll just give you some examples. Well, really, like I had mentioned before, you can think of this as an agricultural census in a way. And what we can do with the data is, is really look at summaries of agriculture in Washington. So here's a bar chart showing simply just the top 25 crops by acres in Washington state. And on the, you can see on the left side that wheat, wheat fallow and CRP really dominate the acres in Washington state. There's almost there's 2.4 million acres of wheat with almost one and a half million acres of wheat fallow in Washington. And those differ somewhat every year depending on what fields are in wheat and wheat fallow. But again, they definitely dominate the top crops in Washington. And then other top crops are pastures and alfalfa hay. We have shellfish on there. There's a lot of shellfish beds that are approved for use by the Department of Health. Not all of those areas are there shellfish beds in them, but those are the areas that are approved for use. Um, grass hay is also one of the top crops, um, as well as some of the more familiar crops probably, um, field corn. And we do differentiate between field corn and sweet corn and um, also apples and potato and Timothy hay, barley and canola. Um, really the, the list goes on. You can see down here to the right, some developed lands have already made its way onto the top 25 crops in the state. So um, I, it goes to show that we grow a lot of agriculture, but also a lot of land has already been taken out um, of agriculture and, and permanently developed. So additionally, it's just looking at top crops. You know, something else that we can do is you can you can look at more specific areas. So here's a chart that shows the top 10 irrigation types in Grant County. You know, Grant County in the Columbia Basin is dominated by center pivot irrigation. Um, there's almost 400,000 acres of center pivot irrigation, but also in Grant County, there's quite a bit of dry land agriculture. So no irrigation is also high on the list as well. And then besides those two, you know, micro sprinklers and rural irrigation, sprinkler, drip, um, and combination. We also include combinations of irrigation types as well in our database. So if a field is a combination between drip and micro sprinkler, um, for example, a lot of small organic uh, market top market crop type operations are, you know, a lot of micro sprinklers and drip irrigated and also wheel line as well and then there's still flood irrigation in grant county and so this is an, uh, another potential use and just looking at and summarizing our data in different ways we can also look at trends so we can look at trends of different acreages like i had mentioned earlier across the state so here's a few examples um, hops well we, this is just the last 10 years of hops acreage in Washington. So in 2010, we had a little over 30,000 acres of hops. And certainly around 2014, 2015, when we saw a really huge boom in the craft brewery industry, not too surprising that acres of hops also increased as well. And now in 2020, we have about 42,000 acres of hops. 
and Washington does grow more hops than any other place in the country. And we, I want to say we grow more than 50% of the hops um, in the world. Here's another example, wine grapes. Definitely seen an increase in wine grape acreage in the last 10 years as well. Starting off um, about 42,000 acres in 2010 and certainly hit a, hit a peak in 2019 and 2020 of near 60,000 acres. So um, again, quite a substantial increase in wine grape acreage. And another example um, is apples. So even a more substantial or steeper incline, if you will, of apple acreage, increase in apple acreage in Washington. In 2010, we had about 173,000 acres of apples. And now in 2020, we're pushing 195,000 acres. And I definitely would not be surprised if even by 2021 or 2022, we have over 200,000 acres of apples in Washington. Obviously, Washington grows a lot of apples, uh, more than the more than 50% of the country's apples grown in Washington. And especially with new varieties coming out like Cosmic Crisp and really the last 10 years, um, Honey Crisp acres and Fuji's and some of the specialty apples that are replacing some of the older varieties. Um, the new ones are more profitable. So definitely seeing an increase. And then newer growing te technologies, trellising the apples, certainly seeing an increase in prof profits. And so a big increase in apple acreage. And here's an example of some crops that well, are not going up in acres. Apricots. In 2010, we had a little over just 1,300 acres in Washington, and we've seen a decline to now about 1,000 acres in Washington. My guess is growers are realizing that maybe they can plant different tree fruit and have a more profitable operation. Also juice grapes as well, Concord grapes. Maybe we've seen a, a swap between juice grape and wine grape operations just simply because of uh, profits. But in 2010, we had almost 24,000 acres of juice grapes. And in 2020, we now we have under uh, 20,000 acres of Concord grapes in Washington. So not only can we produce agricultural summaries and look at trends across the state, we can also connect this data to our other programs, like I had mentioned earlier. And I'll give you a, I'll give you an example of how we connect this to our water quality monitoring program. So here's a map statewide that uh, that shows different watersheds in Washington. So these are all these are all the smallest delineated watersheds in Washington, and what they are is they're categorized by the percent of agriculture in each one. Obviously, in the Palouse and Eastern Washington, we have a very high percent of agriculture in each watershed, and we can use maps like this to help. Uh, prioritize some of our surface water monitoring areas. So certainly I created this box around the lower Yakima Valley where it has quite a few watersheds um, of irrigated agriculture really that have it's a high percent of irrigated agriculture and we can zoom in. Um, uh, I guess I also want to say that the dark red is again the highest percent of agriculture in each watershed and the tan is the lowest percent. So, um, and if there's no watershed there, me meaning we did not have agriculture in that watershed. And if you zoom in on this lower Yakima area, um, there's two watersheds here that obviously are almost dominated by agriculture. And if we want to understand that these will be good watersheds to help monitor for pesticides in, we can take a look at the agriculture breakdown in each one. 
to both dry land and irrigated agriculture in each of these watersheds. And these are actually two examples of watersheds that we've been monitoring for over 15 years for pesticides. They, um, they have a high percent of irrigated agriculture and they also um, are habitat for salmon um, running up the Yakima River as well. So they're, they're high priority watersheds that we have been monitoring for a number of years. And this is an example, again, of how we can connect our uh, ag land use mapping data and help prioritize monitoring and other sorts of efforts. So if, if there's other ideas that you have in your head about how you could possibly use our data for things like this to be able to prioritize efforts for certain projects, um, Hopefully this will spark, spark some ideas in your head. Also, we can look at and we can connect our mapping with our pesticide usage data. So we've collected pesticide usage data for um, the active ingredient glyphosate. And we do not have every, which is the uh, active ingredient in Roundup, as well as a lot of other different products, very, very, very commonly used herbicide. And we do not, we have not been able to survey every commodity that uses glyphosate because there's a wide variety, very, very wide variety of commodities. But this is an example of the ones that we have surveyed, how we can connect that data with our location of crops. And we can summarize uh, the usage intensity by pounds of glyphosate per year, per acre, and summarize it at the section level statewide. So this is an example of data that we can send to EPA and other federal entities to help them with the registration process about this is our most accurate knowledge of exactly how many pounds per acre per year of a certain active ingredient is being used in Washington. So I, like I had mentioned earlier, and there's already a question about this, the, the data is, is used for the voluntary stewardship program. I don't have a, a lot more information to give on that topic, but certainly if you want to know more, you can email me and I will get you in touch with the correct person in our group. Um, I also correct, I also created legislative and congressional district maps to summarize the agriculture. And I'll give you an example of these maps. If some of you are familiar with ArcGIS Online and some of the operations and things that it can do. This is, uh, I think, a really cool use and an easy way to summarize areas and summarize our data. This can be used by legislators, certainly during legislative times of year, if they're curious about agriculture in their own districts. On the drop down here, you can zoom in on certain areas. And these charts will automatically repopulate the, the figures within that legislative district. So in district number five, and I hope this is updating appropriately on other people's end, but on district number five, we have 11,000 total acres. And we have, we don't collect information on dairies. This is information from another um, group in our agency that's also on this map show the number of dairies and the total acres of agriculture in this legislative district, as well as the acres of pastures, um, hay or silage, turf grass, which includes golf courses. And the list goes on and it's categorized by the crop group. It does not show the type of crop simply because that would be way too much information to show on this screen. But again, you can zoom in on the map and it will display the crop type. And if you zoom in, it, it will display each individual field that's mapped. And this is an example from King County near the Snoqualmie and Fall City Incarnation area. The data is also used during the federal pesticide registration process. I had mentioned that earlier, that 
we communicate with EPA and the National Marine Fishery Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and provide them with our mapping data. And really just to allow them and help them to make the most informed decisions about agriculture in Washington. You know, our jobs are to support in agriculture in our state while keeping ecosystems healthy. We want them to make the most informed decisions. Like I had mentioned earlier, we have some drought and wildfire mapping capabilities with this data. And there's also some endangered species issues. And I wanted to give you an example of um, an example of stream buffers and how we can use our data to help understand some decisions. There, here's an example of if EPA wants to implement and change a pesticide label. Um, here's an example, and it would require a 500 foot buffer between a stream. So pe the pesticide cannot be applied within 500 feet of a stream. And this is something that is, is potentially not too uncommon. That could happen. And we can use our mapping data to understand how it might affect, uh, how implement implementation like that might affect agriculture in Washington. So here's an example of a berry field in Whatcom County, and the light green shows the streams. And using some GIS software, we can put a 500 foot buffer on these streams. And then with our ag land use data, we'll be able to calculate really the acres that might be affected by, by a label change at the federal level. So here's a, another example of how we can really just make the most informed decisions based off of data. Next, I wanted to touch on the future of agricultural land use mapping, and then I'm almost done with my presentation for the day. We have some partnerships um, with NASA and WSU to improve remote sensing and really to better capture, better capture double cropping and fallow fields as well. With the, the way that, and the, that satellite imagery really is improving and increasing, and it will only get better in the future, I definitely foresee more acres being able to be mapped remotely, remotely sensed, and probably less windshield surveys in the future. But I, it's, we're still a long ways away from that with our capabilities right now. And so next, I wanted to hop back into some of these, I'd mentioned going back through these crops and letting you know if you scribble down what you thought some of them were, some of them will be very difficult, and I just wanted to show the wide, wide diversity of crops, but I thought I'd go back through and show some of these crops before my presentation is over for the day. So right here, this is these are wine grapes. This is a wine grape field um, in eastern Washington. And this one is also tricky, but this is also a wine grape field. This is in Western Washington. So this is in Skamania County. You're looking down at the Columbia River Gorge. Um, Skamania County is interesting because it's one of the few Western Washington counties where we really encounter more Eastern Washington type of growing operations. And this is sweet corn. Um, you can. This is this is a sweet corn field from eastern Washington as well. Not a lot of large acres of sweet corn grown in western Washington. This is a cran. This is a cranberry bog. So this is the we grow cranberries in Grays Harbor and Pacific counties on the coast. And this is a photo of one of the cranberry bogs. If you're from those counties um, really this should look pretty familiar to you here is a picture of a cucumber field in Skagit County being air irrigated with um, that's called big gun irrigation and cucumbers in Skagit County 
this is a very interesting one and it's very unique to Western Washington in that it might be unknown to some, but Western Washington and specifically the Skagit area is um, really very important on the world scene for growing certain vegetable seed crops. So this is spinach seed. And I, I wanna say that Skagit County specifically in some parts of Snohomish County grow over 50% of the world's spinach seed. So very important. And uh, one indication is growing um, you know, male and female plants, crops in the same field. But again, spinach seed. I thought this would be an interesting one to include. Like I had mentioned, for some industrial hemp crops, given the nature of the crop, it's the growers certainly like to disclose what they're growing to the public from the roadside. This is from Eastern Washington. This, this one is very tricky. There's only less than five fields of this crop in the whole state, but this is, this is a quinoa field. Uh, there might be just a small handful in Western Washington and really just a few in Eastern Washington as well. This is also a, ve a very difficult crop, but I thought I would share just the wide variety in Washington, but this is a yarrow seed crop. So yarrow, um, not something that you would really think of when you think of agriculture. And these are oats. Uh, it might be difficult to see, but this is an oat crop. This is alfalfa seed. So this is probably taken down in the Tushi Walla Walla area. They grow a lot of alfalfa for seed there. Th these are hops. Um, yep, very common in the Moxie Yakima area. And I this is ryegrass seed. So you can maybe see that the grass is grown in rows, it's also a bunch grass, it's been harvested, but this is ryegrass seed. And so I this is I want to thank you for listening today. I hope that I gave you some ideas and you're able to potentially use some of the data that we collect for your organizations. And um, you let me know if you have any questions now and certainly email me, call me or any of the other people in our group um, for any questions. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen. Yeah, thank you very much, Joel. We do have a couple more questions in the box here. Um, one question, is CRP categorized consistently each time the field is surveyed? For example, I found that CRP has been categorized as CRP some years and as other in different years. That's a great question. You know, it's not something that I cover in Western Washington. And so my knowledge is limited but I know that we try and map every single field and every acre as accurately as possible whenever we see the fields. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions about county level um, statistics and um, summaries. Is the breakdown data available by county just as it is by legislative district? And similarly, um, USDA publishes one to two page flyers, but we think that this data would be more accurate than those. Is there something similar with your data? We currently do not have it summarized at the county level, but that would be something that I could easily create and share and make a public map. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, just send me an email. And I, I really would be a very easy thing to create on ArcGIS Online to summarize by county levels, um, I know the pivot tables that we have available, you can look at the numbers pretty quickly and easily. You can look at different irrigation types, but if, if it's an online map, um, send me an email and we can talk about the options. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, another question here for the riparian buffer feature, is it able to quantify how much agricultural land encompasses the buffer area? Yes, I think, you know, with it's, it can certainly be a GIS operation. If you create a buffer, you can, if you're familiar, you can clip certain fields by other fields in the GIS realm, and then you can add up the total acres that might be affected or not affected by implementing a buffer. 
we have a, uh, a vote for county level maps <laughs> okay. here. Um, and then a, a question, how do we access the legislative district maps? It is available on our WSDA. It's not on our NRAS webpage. If you just Google um, WSDA legislative district maps or congressional district maps, um, it'll lead you right to the web page. And I can um, I can create a county level map. And really those those maps can be created with any sort of boundary. So again, like legislative district, congressional districts, we collect data, we collect county as an attribute. So it's easy to summarize data by county, but you can also do it by by conservation district boundary as well. And then it looks like um, Perry had uh, put a couple comments in here about the FSA data. And Perry, I'm happy to unmute you if you wanted to um, speak directly to this. Yeah, I think if everybody can see those comments, the uh, one of the questions was, uh, how do we get access to the FSA data? And uh, um, and we don't. Uh, we used to before the, I think it was a 2008 farm bill, but uh, uh, we get it through the uh, USDA CDL because that CDL uses FSA data to ground truth. And so that's why that is so effective for those uh, areas with program crops. And, and we don't have to do those windshield surveys as Joel had mentioned. Um, I think we have just a minute or two left if anybody has any final uh, questions or thoughts. But otherwise, it sounds like Joel is uh, available for some follow up, particularly on that county level data if you're interested. So thanks for that, Joel. Not seeing any other things in the questions box. You can also raise your hand if you have anything. I'm happy to unmute you and you could ask directly as well. Okay, well, I guess I just wanted to else? also say again, thank you for everyone who joined and um, it let me know about potential maps or other things that I can help out with and create. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Joel. A really informative presentation today. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll get some individual follow up on some of these uh, county questions. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And you can always check out the CTD website for uh, more upcoming webinars. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye bye.